and um, this evening's webinar is aimed to give you some um, advice on what to expect and some tips to try and get the most out of your um, GP appointments, gynecological appointments um, going forward. So, could I have endometriosis? Um, this is a question that many people have, you know, come across. And my advice to you is if you have been struggling with symptoms of endometriosis, um, so specifically pain in the lower abdomen, so in your belly, um, are experiencing increasing symptoms of pain specifically during the time of a period, or pain um, during sexual intercourse or after sexual intercourse, pain around toileting, so having your bowels moved, passing stool or passing urine, or noticing any blood in the urine or, uh, or in the or in your steel, especially around the time of a period, then these can be um, like symptoms and triggers of endometriosis. Also, if you've been struggling to um, get pregnant, this is also an indication that the, of um, potential endometriosis. So it is important that you um, get some support and see your GP um, for that initial um, further assessment. So it's always good to mention that um, GPs are medically trained to deal with hundreds, if not thousands of medical conditions. And although some um, GPs may have a specialist interest in um, women's health or gynecology or endometriosis, GPs are not um, specifically specialists within endometriosis. And what we can also find is as some of the symptoms of endometriosis can also be common symptoms of other health conditions, this can potentially lead to delays in diagnosis as we may be investigating and really ruling, ruling out other conditions. Um, so such as irritable bowel syndrome, um, urinary tract infections and pelvic infections. It is important to um, note that when other health conditions have been ruled out and you know, you've, or you've started some form of treatment, medication and symptoms are not getting any better or potentially getting worse, must also re revisit your GP, keep them informed of what's happening with you and your symptoms. This isn't something that you should be told to put up with. These are not normal period symptoms. And, you know, we really, we really do need to try and increase this, the awareness as, you know, there are one in 10 um, women or, or women who are assigned female at birth who, have, who are suffering with this condition. So, how to prepare for your, this appointment with your GP. So the tips are to try and provide your GP with as much information as possible about your health and your symptoms. And this will hopefully speed up your diagnosis. Now, I recommend that you keep a diary of um, your symptoms and this can be done in a number of ways. So it becomes something very simple, such as making a note on a calendar um, or using a phone application to track symptoms of pain in your period or using a paper document and um, I'll show you an example of one shortly. So tracking periods and symptoms can help um, identify patterns associated with your menstrual cycle. Although not everyone's symptoms specifically match with the menstrual cycle, it can be a useful tool for doctors and nurses to use to help identify and um, recognize a potential gynecological condition. And even if you're not having periods, so say if you're on contraception um, and you're, you, you know, you're not necessarily tracking periods, it's still useful to track your symptoms so you can demonstrate then and show how these sym symptoms are affecting your quality of life. So I've um, copied here a, um, a tool which is downloadable from the Endometriosis UK website. So this is a um, pain and symptom diary. So as you can see, this gives a snapshot, uh, a snapshot over a week um, where you can document whether or not you're on your period and um, describe what your pain's like, if there are any other associated symptoms and how this is, ha how this is impacting you. So this can be a good tool to go through with your healthcare provider um, you know, things that you might have tried to improve symptoms, say taking pain relief and has there been any improvement um, or, you know, and just to kind of demonstrate how regularly these symptoms are occurring and how it's impacting your quality of life. So your GP may um, request some initial investigations. 
and this can help um, determine you know the root of what to do next so an examination may be recommended and the reason for this is to one have a feel of the abdomen and see if there's any potential areas of pain um, any lumps bumps masses or any potential cysts um, also can be recommended to do an internal examination so a speculum so a bit similar to like when um, ladies undergo having a smear test but without actually doing the smear so this involves like a, a small speculum that can be inserted to have a look inside the vagina to check everything appears normal with the cervix um, and see if there's any potential signs as to why you're experiencing these symptoms now, if you if you don't feel that that's something that you'd be able to tolerate, then by all means, you know it's not it's not something that is is necessary. Um, now, also important to note that an examination, uh, you know, if you have an examination and that your doctor or nurse doesn't see anything that's abnormal, and um, doesn't rule out a diagnosis of endometriosis. Okay. Um, an ultrasound scan may also be requested. Um, an ultrasound scan, so. This uses sound waves, which produces images at the inside of the body. And the reason they use this is to try and detect if there's any um, changes, looking at the size and the outline of organs and tissues. Now, ultrasound scans can um, give, give us quite a lot of information, but again, it's not, it's not always diagnostic of endometriosis. So if, we do, if you do have a scan and it comes back all clear and there's, there's no um, findings of endometriosis, it doesn't rule out a diagnosis. Now, the most um, effective method of scanning would be a transvaginal scan. And this just gives us a clearer, more detailed view of the reproductive organs. Now, a transvaginal um, scan, what this involves is a small probe that's inserted into the vagina um, just to get that, that clear review of the reproductive organs. So what to do if you feel that you're not being listened to or you don't feel like you're getting anywhere um, with your care? Um, I'd advise that you, you know, book in another appointment with your GP and re-communicate your symptoms to them and you know state to them could this be endometriosis explain that you've done your own reading um, and that you feel that your symptoms um, could be related to endometriosis and just you know explain that these symptoms are having an impact on your quality of life and that you want something doing about it you can always ask for a second opinion as well so especially if you've got if there's um, other GPs within the within your GP practice, you could ask to um, be seen by another GP, or you know if there is only one GP available, then you, ultimately you could change GP practices for that second opinion. If you if you're feeling like you're not getting anywhere, then the other option would be to also raise a complaint, as you know that wouldn't be appropriate care. So you are also within your right to ask for a. Ref referral to a gynecologist so if you are still suffering with gynecological symptoms and you feel that your GP is unable to treat you um, then you should be they should be at that point referring you for some specialist advice and input so once you have uh, referred to um, a gynecology service it's important to mention that not all gynecologists technically specialize in endometriosis. There can be, um, within gynecology, there are um, subspecialities. So it'd be, you know, recommended to, for you to be actually be referred to a gynecologist who has this, an interest or special, specializes in endometriosis. And for, in cases where there is suspicion of endometriosis, which could be potentially affecting other organs, um, such as the bladder, bowel, or the ureters, which are the um, tubes which drain urine from the um, kidneys to the um, bladder, or endometriosis outside of the pelvic cavity, then the recommendation is that um, you should be referred to a specialist endometriosis center. Now you can search for um, accredited endometriosis centers, which are local to you via using the um, British Society for Gynecological Endoscopy website. And they have a list there of the accredited centers. Um, now you don't need to wait to see a gynecologist or a specialist nurse in order to start um, treatment. 
So if you're seeing your GP, um, they may recommend initial treatment such as um, anti-inflammatory medication um, with or without the use of hormonal treatments. And the first line of this would be like contraceptive medication. So it's good to have a chat with your doctor and speak about your pain management, what you're taking currently, what's working, what's not working, so they can assess you for more appropriate pain control. And also for the appropriateness of hormonal treatments. Um, so this may not be appropriate for everyone um, due to the contraceptive effects or if, if they're not unable to be tolerated previously due to side effects, but it is, an, it is an option of management to try and help with the management of symptoms. So the first line contraceptives would be um, the oral contraceptive pills, so such as the combined oral contraceptive pill, which is an estradiol and progesterone medication, or a progesterone only pill, such as the mini pill. And progesterones can also be um, administered not just for a tablet form, but there's also the contraceptive implant and injection and the Mirena coil, which is a um, device which is inserted into the womb, so the uterus, which again, um, this secretes progesterone. And these treatments can be um, initiated by your GP or practice nurse. So yeah, at the point of seeing a um, gynecologist or a specialist nurse, so important to mention again that this the um, information sharing is again key. Um, your specialist will have received a referral, and um, so they'll be aware of you. But this is usually quite a brief summary, and the best person to really explain your symptoms is you. Um, you you know you know yourself better than no one else, um, and this is where the symptom pain diary can also um, provide a lot of information. So make sure when you attend that appointment, like this. Um, you know, if it's updated, you've um, got information there that you can um, use as a reminder of, 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 of what's been happening. Um, just to also expect to be asked a lot of questions, um, not just about your endometriosis symptoms and your periods, but about your overall general health, any medical and surgical history. Um, it may also be useful to take along with you a copy of a prescription or a medication list, as sometimes you know it can be difficult to remember um, names of medications, doses, etc. And just don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, this is your opportunity to ask the special ask the specialists. Um, before you attend the consultation, you know, have a think. What's if you've had any burning questions that you know you want to ask? make a note of these, take a written copy with you along to a consultation as a reminder, or even consider taking a family member or a friend with you for that extra support and guidance. Um, and before you leave the consultation or your appointment, you know, make sure that you understand what's happened. You know, if you're not, if you don't understand, then just, you need to ask and make it, ensure that the, um, using terminology that's understandable to you, the patient, and make sure that there's a plan in place so you know what's happening in the next stages. So um, whether that's going to be further investigations or a follow-up appointment, um, you know, make sure you know what the next stages are. So the um, hospital and clinic may also request some further investigations. And this may include further examination on ultrasound scans. So even if you've had these done um, in the GP setting or in the community, it sometimes may be um, appropriate to, for them to be um, carried out again. And the reason for this is because you're, when you're seeing a specialist, they're more experienced in their examination and what they're looking, you know, what they're looking for, because they, they see it more commonly. Um, also, with again with the scans, the sonographers are more specialized, can be occasionally more specialized or um, see a, a higher prevalence of endometriosis. So it can also be recommended that these images, um, scans, and examinations are carried out again. Um, you can always ask for a chaperone to be present during any examinations, um, especially for intimate examinations. And you know, don't feel that this is something that necessarily has to go ahead. Go ahead if you feel that you're having, you know, especially if you're having a flare of symptoms, or you know, just feel like you wouldn't be able to tolerate an examination. This can be refused, um, or even you know, stopped halfway through if if it was if it was too uncomfortable. Um, 
maybe that you've an MRI scan may be recommended. Um, so an MRI scan is a different form of scanning compared to an ultrasound scan. And this uses magnetism and radio waves. And the scan creates images from angles of the body. And it's, it's good at showing up soft tissue and it can be diagnostic for some forms of endometriosis, such as deep infiltrative endometriosis and endometriomas, which are endometriosis cysts, sometimes referred to as chocolate cysts. Um, but again, an MRI scan and ultrasound scans, examinations, they negative results do not rule out a diagnosis of endometriosis. So we they don't we don't pick up um, all types of endometriosis through through these methods. Um, so. A diagnostic laparoscopy um, remains the um, like the gold standard diagnostic um, treatment for endometriosis. And what a laparoscopy is, is this is keyhole surgery. And it's used to, I, to have a look and identify the internal organs of the pelvis to detect for signs of endometriosis. So they usually make a, a cut in the, um, a small cut in the belly button where they insert a small telescopic camera, which is a laparoscope. And this enables the surgeon to have a like 360 degree view of the abdomen and pelvis to see and diagnose endometriosis. And there may also be some um, one or two other cuts where they would then use instruments to, so they can mobilize the organ. So they're having a good, a good look throughout the pelvis and abdomen. So um, planning treatment. Treatment planning should be a two-way process between both the patient and the healthcare professionals. And the, this should be a conversation that um, is between the, the, the both parties and should be individualized and tailored um, dependent on symptoms and previous history and the patient's priorities. And recommend recommendations will be made secondary to this. So there are some questions that, um, you know, are commonly asked or that you may want to consider when you're having a consultation, um, such as what do you think is causing these symptoms? You know, um, ask your um, specialist, do you think that these symptoms suggest endometriosis? And if not, what else could, do you think it could be? Um, when will I get my diagnosis and how long do things usually take? So it's good to have a um, idea of timeframes. Um, so, you know, for example, if you are, are sent for a scan, how long are you gonna be expecting to wait for that scan? And then how long will it take to get the results? And um, having that indication of timeframes can help manage expectations. And then you will know will be expecting then when you will be receiving any follow-up or results coming through. Um, same with surgery, if, you, if surgery is recommended, how long is the surgery looking like it's gonna take with waiting times, et cetera. Um, and also asking what are your treatment options? You know, Making sure you, you have that understanding of um, what's available and appropriate for you. Um, I'm not gonna go through each one of them in depth because that's a whole webinar in itself, um, but it's just to make sure that you're you know, considering um, pain management um, would hormone treatment be suitable for you? Would surgery be suitable for you? And if so, what type of surgery would be recommended? Um, so, you know, making sure that they're covering all, all options with you and also considering what you've experienced previously, if you've tried certain medications, have they worked well for you before? Or, and, you know, have they not worked well for you? Um, so it's just good to have that discussion around all three options. And then if, you, if for those who are trying to get pregnant, does this affect things? Well, potentially, yes. Um, we wouldn't want to start people on hormonal treatment due to the contraceptive effects if you're um, trying to um, get pregnant. Um, so if this, is an, if this is something that people have been trying, you know, been try, if they've been trying to conceive and that could be for a period of time, um, is it? Do we need to get um, fertility teams involved in supporting this, carrying out further investigation? So this is something you know that needs to be discussed at the time of the consultation. Um, and then, if treatment is recommended, then what if the treatment doesn't help? So having that um, discussion about you know 
what if it doesn't help? What next? Or is there any support I can get in the wait for my next appointment if I'm struggling with symptoms? Um, so I'm jumping ahead here, but then that would um, link in with, is there like a specialist nurse available who you can contact in between clinics? Um, do you have information leaflets? And um, so having that having that contact with somebody um, can be helpful and also taking leaflets home with you because it's difficult to retain all this information in a, in a consultation or a, or a clinic appointment. And will I need an operation? Um, it's difficult for me to say that yes or no as a whole because it's very individualized. Um, but, you know, people this, there are groups of people that don't want to go down the surgical route and you know an operation is, you know it doesn't if the suspect in endometriosis you, it doesn't mean you have to have surgery um, but this is all very individualized dependent on priorities symptoms and if surgery is something that could potentially help improve um, symptoms and gain a diagnosis then yes that should be an option that's available to you So is there any other support available? So the answer is yes. Um, you don't want anybody to be suffering in silence. And it is completely normal to leave a GP appointment or um, a clinic consultation with even more questions than when you went in, like what you went in with. Um, receiving a diagnosis of endometriosis can be a daunting experience, and it shouldn't be something that you should have to face alone. Now, Endometriosis UK, um, we offer information and support to those affected by endometriosis. And um, there's a support network available which can connect you to an online community, helpline, web chat, and local support groups. So I've provided a link there. And that's the presentation, so the webinar, but um, complete. But please um, feel free to um, send in any questions. And Thank I hope it was you. helpful. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joe. Um, so I'm going to start with the first um, question. So a teenager's period pain has not been um, eased um, by painkillers or contraceptions. Is there any tests or medications um, they should be requesting at the appointments? Um, she's had two ultrasounds, which didn't show anything. And this is from a parent. Okay. Um... Firstly, I'm sorry to hear this. Um, the, so with adolescents or with teenagers, um, the nice, so the guidelines suggest that anybody who is age 17 um, years or younger should, with suspected or confirmed endometriosis, should either refer to a adolescent gynecology service or a specialist endometriosis service. And um, so I'm not sure on the age or who their appointments have been with, but firstly, this should be actioned, um, especially seeing as though there's not been any improvements with um, medical management and painkillers, contraceptive so far and there's been negative negative scan findings um also would be dependent on what type of scan they had because age would it be appropriate for them to have had a transvaginal scan um they may all cons may consider an mri scan um for for further assessment as this could be less invasive than um surgery but um generally dependent on the symptoms and age and risks the same treatment really applies as it does to adults so um the medical hormonal options and then potentially if there's no um positive res response and um, a consideration for a diagnostic laparoscopy thank you joe um so and my next question is once diagnosed how should endometriosis be monitored and this is a two-part question, so I'll, 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 I can say both, um, and then you can. Okay, so, so how it should be monitored once it's diagnosed. Yeah. Okay, um, so there are no specific guidelines um, that recommend frequency or the type of monitoring. Um, so this could differ between different hospitals. Um, Ideally, this follow-up should be based on the individual's previous or current treatments and the severity of their endometriosis. And if there's been any changes to symptoms, um, you know, could that initiate another scan if there's been if this if there's been some you know big changes with symptoms? Um, 
So there is some recommendations with the NICE guidelines that um, although it doesn't say how they should be followed up or what time frame, but for um, those who have been identified to have um, deep infiltrative endometriosis, um, so say involving the bowel or bladder, or if they have um, endometrioma or one or more endometriomas that are larger than three centimeters, then they do state that follow-up should be considered. But again, there's no um, recommendation on the frequency or timeframes of that. Thank you. And um, the second part of this question is, in addition to gynecologists, are there any other specialists you would generally consider relevant, helpful for an endometriosis patient to consult? Um, yeah. Um, so this would be very dependent on the patient's symptoms, um, what was you know what was troubling them, um, and where the endometriosis is suspected or diagnosed. So, um, if it was that endometriosis was suspected or diagnosed when it was affecting the bowel or the renal system, such as the bladder or ureters, then input from a colorectal um, bowel specialist or a urologist. Um, if pain isn't being effectively controlled then um, referral and input from a pain specialist or a pain management team um, fertility specialists if fertility is an issue um, and then there's like pelvic floor physiotherapists psychosexual therapists um, pain psychologists there's lots of there's lots of professionals that um, we can link in with as a multidisciplinary team um, to try and look try and manage and uh, the the wide range of symptoms but again it'll be very individualized into what that pa patient um symptoms were thank you joe that's a really long list <laughs> <laughs> um and i'm asking a question from the q a function so um is the trans vaginal scan 100 percent accurate for diagnosing endometriosis no <laughs> um so no, there is no form of imaging is 100% accurate. So it's, um, so scans, transvaginal scans, um, you can have a transvaginal scan and it comes back all clear um, and they still have, may have endometriosis, which has been identified in surgery. Um, it can, transvaginal scans are a good method of, of imaging and can give um, health professionals a, an indication of what's happening in the pelvis but for um, like superficial deposits of endometriosis and um, they're not generally you know are not always picked up on a on a scan thank you um how hold on for a moment um so how would someone get back to hospital services after being discharged with another um another condition and still have endometriosis um, sorry, if you say that again. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. This it's is okay. a bit of a complicated question. So, um, so how would someone um, get back to hospital services after being discharged um, with another illness and they had endometriosis? Okay. Um, so, first line, you have to revisit your GP, discuss your symptoms, um, just because you, you know have been diagnosed with one condition it doesn't mean that you automatically might not have another a condition um so and it would also depend on if they've undergone previous investigations to assess for endometriosis or tried any any other forms of medical treatment options or had previous surgery but no if symptoms are continuing there should be no reason why as to why you couldn't be referred for us to for to gynecology or for a second opinion you know just because there's one condition you've or you've been diagnosed with one condition doesn't mean that doesn't exclude that there's potentially other things going on i hope that answers the question thank you jack um and so please can you explain how painkillers and contraception hormonal treatments treat endometriosis okay so um painkillers they treat the symptoms of endometriosis um rather than the endometriosis itself um so there are different levels of of pain of pain medication um they're from over-the-counter medications such as paracetamol or, or um ibuprofen or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Non so the aim of pain medication is to 
help alleviate symptoms of pain um, for the non-steroidal and medications such as ibuprofen is to reduce and manage the inflammatory response secondary to um, endometriosis. Um, there's also the option of um, neuromodulators, but if there's any, you know, if there's nerve involvement and nerve pain secondary to endometriosis, and then the hormonal options, um, what their aim is, is to suppress estrogen. And um, so estrogen is the, um, like a female sex hormone, which kind of can feed the condition. And um, so by suppressing um, estrogen, the, the endometriosis um, should, be should be treated more effectively. Um, you know, hormonal treatments, there are a variety of them, um, as I, I mentioned briefly before, and can be sometimes finding the, the right one that suits you. Um, and, you know, they might not be suitable for everybody, but yeah, the aim is to help manage the symptoms, um, but they don't technically cure the condition. Uh, you're on mute, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Sorry, I was just apologising because my internet signal went a bit out, so there might have been some tech difficulties, so I apologise. Um, thank you for answering that question and um my next one is is it possible um do you know oh yes yeah. so is it possible um is it possible for one um after being just charged from the gynae outpatient to get a referral directly to um the endometriosis clinic or does it have to go through um the gynae outpatient again um, yes. So um, not all patients have to be managed through an accredited endometriosis center, but um, where definitely when there's suspicion of deep endometriosis or in more complex cases where symptoms are not being effectively managed um, with, with medical treatment or previous surgery, then a referral to an endometriosis center can also be considered. Um, and also if during, if there's any um, diagnostic laparoscopy and um, going ahead it should be um, carried out by a gynecologist who's trained with skills in laparoscopic um, surgery specifically for endometriosis so they can perform that systemic uh, like so of like a 360 inspection and review of the pelvis but referrals can be um, completed by um, any healthcare professional who feels that it, that that would be the right form of treatment next. So say a GP, another gynecologist, you might be seen in a general outpatient setting or of a healthcare provider. So say if you've seen a, a bowel specialist and they've identified um, endometriosis, they could refer you um, directly to an endometriosis clinic too. Thank you. Um, and so someone in the 30s, so someone's 30 years old um, has just started experiencing problems in the last year, um, which they think could be endometriosis. Is it possible that endometriosis could um, start this late, um, even if there could be no signs or symptoms before? Yes. Um, so yes, it is a possibility. Um, we There are people who have endometriosis who are who what we call asymptomatic, so have had no symptoms of endometriosis, um, even, you know, with... Um, they might have had quite a high um, degree of endometriosis and they've not had any symptoms. So um, it's difficult if it's never been investigated before to say whether it's something that's previously been there, but especially, but definitely if you're experiencing any symptoms that are typical of endometriosis um, and it's having an impact, you know, symptoms are affecting you, um, then by all means, you know, you know, get in touch with your doctor for that um, further assessment. Thank you. And um, so how do you stop um, your doctor um, explain, taking the time to explain the basics of endometriosis when you already know this and you don't really want to waste the consultation time? Okay. So um, not everybody has um, maybe that level of understanding. So it is important for doctors and nurses um, to allocate or like provide time during the consultation to explain um, like basic terminology or the basic terms because um, we wouldn't want to skip that part for those that don't um, understand or who made that who may, may need that explanation but you know for those who already know that know know this um, stuff and have already already 
got that level of understanding, then I'd just say, just, um, just tell your doctor or your nurse, just be, you know, you can in politely interrupt them, say, yeah, I'm aware of this. I've had it, I've, you know, I've had it discussed with me before. Um, and I'm sure that I'd like, be more than happy just to carry on with the consultation. Um, and they wouldn't be offended. Or I wouldn't be offended anyway. Thank you, Joe. Um, and so my next question is for someone, um, so they've just moved to a new city. Um, they had experience with a really um, a great granny, um, but this time they've had experience with someone who was very dismissive and didn't listen. Um, can they ask their GP to refer them to a different gynae if they're unhappy with that service? Yeah. Um, so you, yes, you can. Um, you can decide where you want your to have your treatment, where you, where you want your care to um, be under. So especially if you're not happy with your care, you can ask to be transferred to somebody else. Um, the best way of doing that is probably um, via your GP um, and just yeah, ask for a referral. Um, and if you know who you want to be referred to, you, cannot, you, can, you can request that um, as part of the referral process. Thank you. Um, so how to structure messages um, to um, PALS, so Patient Advice Liaison Service, um, when you don't agree with being discharged? Okay. Um, so you should complain directly to the um, organization or the te person, team who were providing the service. So in this case, it would be the discharge in hospital. Um, and the best way to raise a complaint would be to contact the um, hospital's PALS team directly. So this can a, a complaint can be raised either via a telephone call um, or by a, by writing a letter or by um, an email, sending an email. And you should probably structure it as in provide a summary of your care so far, um, what hap what's happened, um, what any concerns or disagreements that you might have. Um, any questions that you want answering as to why you've been discharged. Um, and if you wanted any um, extra advice, um, which is independent, so um, not involving the NHS, there's also the Independent Complaints Advocacy Service, um, which I don't know the number or details off of my head, but they could be Googled. Um, and they could also provide you with support of how to submit a, um, a complaint. Thank you, Joe. Um, so is there a level or percentage of adhesions um, around affected areas that doctors believe um, surgery is the best next option? Shall I repeat that again? Yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so is there a level or percentage of adhesions around the affected areas that doctors um, refer you to surgery? Um, so if, so adhesions, um, can be, uh, can be secondary to having endometriosis because of the process of these, of the endometriosis cells, um, bleeding, the inflammation process, it can cause scar tissue in the pelvis. Um, adhesions can be quite tricky to sometimes manage because, um, surgery as well, going in and having surgery can cause some, can cause scar tissue. Um, so there isn't a really a, a, a rule as to how many adhesions there has to be in the pelvis to warrant having surgery. It's more of how, what your symptoms are and um, whether the surgeon would, would feels that surgery and, and removal of endometriosis and removal of adhesions, which is adhesiolysis, would be suitable for you depending on your situation and um, symptoms. Okay. Thank you. Um, so why can CA125 be elevated due to endometriosis and why oh, and would they be um, a screening tool? Um, so CA125 is a, um, is in the, well, the guidelines suggest that it shouldn't be, well, it's not recommended um, to be used as a screen, as a biomarker or a screening tool um, to diagnose endometriosis. 
Um, in some people, they can have a CA125, um, which is raised and they've got endometriosis. And then there can be a group of people where they have a normal CA125 and they have a diagnosis of endometriosis. So it's not in itself diagnostic. Um, and what a CA125, well, basically this is a protein that can be identified in the blood um, and it can also be elevated um, due to a number of um, pelvic inflammatory um, responses. So it can be caused by things such as endometriosis, um, fibroids or uterine fibroids, ovarian cysts, um, pelvic inflammatory disease, or even um, sometimes just having a period. So that having, a, having the inflammation response secondary to your period um, can, can um, increase the CA125. Um, so CA125s are more useful um, in the management of patients with known ovarian cancer, as it's one of the indicators to like assess how they're responding to treatment, et cetera. But um, so yes, it can be raised um, with ladies of endometriosis, but we don't use it as a screening or diagnostic tool as, a, as recommended by the guidelines. Thank you. Um, so someone um, has um, stage two endometriosis and they're trying to get pregnant. And they want to know what treatments are available um, and what they should ask at their follow-up appointments. Um, so if they're trying to if they're trying to conceive now, um, which I'm, I'm by the sounds of it they are, then the hormonal treatments wouldn't be appropriate um, because of the contraceptive effects. And even for medical options that aren't licensed as contraceptions, um, you know the advice would be we wouldn't want you to conceive on these on this medication um so it would be more looking at pain management um surgery so um if you if surgical management um removal of endometriosis um could still be an option um and you know that potentially may um help assist with fertility um the for well more for a stage two endometriosis but it's having that input from a fertility team as well so when you when you when you go to your follow-up appointment and um, just explaining to your um gynecologist or a specialist that you know you are trying to pursue family and um if you've not already been referred could you be referred to a to the fertility team thank you Jay. Um, and what can I expect from my first appointment at a tertiary endometriosis clinic versus a general gynecology, gynecology appointment? Um, as they're going to uh, tertiary care um, after a scan, um, after actually this, this, after a scan, um, after a diagnosis of rectovaginal endometriosis. Okay. Um so um, as discussed in a presentation, um, what to expect. So you're probably going to be, again, be asked a lot of questions. So remembering this is your first time with this new clinic, so this new service. So although you've probably had to answer these questions numerous of times, numerous times, it'll be, it's good to reiterate this to the endometriosis team so they have a full picture of you, and your history and your symptoms. Um, and as mentioned before, they may want to carry out their own um, investigations, such as examinations and scans. Um, but when we've, with rectovaginal endometriosis, um, yes, they've done the right thing. They, you, the recommendation is that you are referred to a accredited endometriosis centre. Um, and the reason for this is to have more of a multidisciplinary team approach, because when the um, rectum is involved and um, we need involvement there it can cause surgery can be a bit more complex from the col from, from a colorectal um, perspective so having input from a colorectal surgeon who specializes in endometriosis surgery um, and having that multidisciplinary team approach with um, other professionals of deciding of what the best treatment options would be for you going forward um, and you would be involved in these discussions as well um, but again, that would include like medical, surgical options. Thank you, Jo. And how do you diagnose the severity um, or stage of, of endometriosis? Um, so this is 
So uh, certain types of endometriosis can be identified on images. So we can, so for example, ultrasound scans and MRI scans, they can um, pick up evidence uh, of deep infiltrative endometriosis, um, endometriomas, so these um, endometriosis cysts on the ovaries, which are referred as chocolate cysts. Um, so they can give an indication, um, but we, the best way of really knowing it is uh, to the extent of the endometriosis is by going in with a laparoscope and having a look. So this is, and I don't do that. I'm not a surgeon. Um, well, this is where the surgeon would have that full assessment of the um, pelvic cavity and dependent on the amount of deposits there are and um, where it's affecting, um, the staging would, would usually is graded between um, one, which is more my, like small um, superficial deposits um, all the way to a stage four where it can be, um, there can be what wide um, spread adhesions or endometriosis, which is um, deeply infiltrative in other organs and um, affecting the ovaries with endometri endometriomas. So it can vary, um, but it would be the surgeon during that assessment, um, during a laparoscopy, who would determine that's that grade or stage of endometriosis. Thank you, Joe. And how likely is endometriosis to be progressive? Do delays um, to treatment, um, such as surgery, impact the likelihood of complications or difficulty getting pregnant? Um, so, difficult question. Um, so, it's, asking <laughs> in light of very long waiting. Waiting, time. yes, yeah. Um, so, it's very. It's I'm I'm. It's difficult to answer because it's it's. <laughs> Would all just be dependent if the if on the individual and whether the endometriosis was progressive. Um, so for it, there are cases where you know endometriosis stays the same and it doesn't you know it doesn't grow any further. But then there are cases where you know endometriosis can spread and grow. Um, so it would be all be it would be very um, dependent on that individual's case. Um, and if there, I, I appreciate the, the way there are. I appreciate the waiting times for surgery. And um, so consideration would be in that wait for an operation. Could we do anything to potentially prevent the progression or to try and manage the symptoms and the condition with medical treatment? Um, so, yeah, it would be already very dependent on where the endometriosis was and that that um, that overall assessment of a patient. But um, that's some that's a question for the individual to have with their healthcare practitioner who knows who knows their case. Thank you, Joe. Okay, so um, this person um, is asking, is there an approximate maximum number of surgeries that specialists are able to complete if endometriosis comes back after a laparoscopy? So um, someone's had one. Um, Sorry, Emma, I, you broke up. I didn't get the beginning of that. Oh, no. Can you, can you hear me now? I'm yeah, right, yeah. I'm right now. Okay. Um, so this person's asking, um, if there's a, an approximate um, maximum number of surgeries that, sur that specialists are able to complete if the um, endometriosis comes back after a laparoscopy. This person's had one last, um, I think about last year um, and they feel their symptoms are returning again. Okay, so is there a maximum amount of laparoscopies somebody can have? Yes. Um, no, no, there's not, there's um, not a rule to say that you can only have a certain amount of laparoscopies. Again, this would be very dependent on um, the individual and their symptoms. Um, but yeah, if if there's been, if you've had one last laparoscopy and you've had endometriosis treated and removed, there is that with any with uh, with any type of endometriosis, there is a risk of recurrence and potential risk that this may require further surgery. But there isn't a a cutoff per se. Um, just be to be mindful that the most laparoscopies you have, that somebody undergoes, um, it can become more risky. And um, so you, this, it would be a risk benefit discussion that you'd have with your surgeon. Um, we wouldn't want to do multiple, multiple, multiple surgeries because of um, the risk of scar tissue and injuries with, um, with surgery. Thank you, Joanne. Um, if a transvaginal scan shows chocolate cysts, 
would other tests like laparoscopies or MRI be carried out to? Um, so that would be also dependent on what the what the patient wanted. If they wanted to go down um, the surgical route to have their endometriosis um, excised or a blood, you know, burnt away or removed, there's a um, they still would be open to have that, that surgery because they have got that diagnosis. When If chocolate cysts or endometriomas have been identified on a scan, that supports a diagnosis of endometriosis. Um, if they are having other symptoms, um, or there's any suspicion of endometriosis elsewhere, such as the bowel or the bladder or affecting the ureters, um, then that may still indicate an MRI scan as well as part of the um, you know, prior to surgery. So we've got that bit more of an understanding of what's going on in, in the pelvis um but yeah just because you've had a scan then doesn't mean that you can't have any any other investigation um but it's been helpful that the scan has helped I identify and diagnose endometriosis for this patient thank you um and can it and is it a well is it well known by professionals that endometriosis can affect the bladder and urinary tract um so if um they were to get kidney infections around um, that time of the month. Um, could it be to do with their endometriosis? And could, yeah, could it be connected? Um, so yes, um, endometriosis can affect the renal system. So um, if you think where your so you have, you have where your womb, so your uterus is, um, you have kind of got your bladder sat in front, your bowel sat behind. So your uterus really kind of like in the middle, sandwiched between the two. And hence why I've set, mentioned them organs because they're the ones that are more commonly affected due to the proximity. Um, and especially if you're noticing it on a cyclical basis. So when it's, if, that, if the symptoms are, you know, are around the time of a period, um, then that again is, is in keeping with potential um, endometriosis affecting them systems. Thank you. Um, are symptoms still likely to be cyclical when taking the pill? Um, are symptoms likely to worsen when taking a break from the pill? Um, so this symptoms differ with, we can differ between um, patients. So some people will experience cyclical um, symptoms only around the time of the period others may experience symptoms throughout the month um you know on a daily basis um it's it's it also depends on the type of pill that they're taking and um, so if it's a if they're taking a um mini pill and they're taking that continuously and not having a break um if they're still having the symptoms is it is it the right treatment for them if they are, I say they're on a combined oral contraceptive pill and they're having a break every month, so they're having a period every month, um, and that's when their symptoms are increasing, then again, is that the right treatment for them? Because if their symptoms are um, increasing at the time when they're having that break and, and having a period, maybe it would be, they could consider trying something where they're not having, they don't need to have a break or they don't need to have a period or take something more continuously. All right. Thank you. Um, and is it possible to request um, from the hospital to have one gynae assigned um, due to them having um, various mental health issues impacting um, their understanding um, and memory? Um, so I don't, I, I don't understand the question. I, I think it's kind of based, at, so maybe they've um, had multiple, been seen by multiple gynecologists okay um, and they would like to be only seen by one and is, okay. um, is it possible to make that request and is it possible to be um so yeah just based on your mental health um issues okay yeah so i th think it means as in do they they want um one gynecologist overseeing their care rather than seeing numerous yeah. people um i think that's a sense you know a sensible request to have with have with um a gynecologist and just explain that you're, it's, you're finding it um, difficult having input from all the numerous members on different gynecologists and can I just have one gynecologist overseeing my care I, yeah I think that's a I think that's a sensible and 
suitable question to be asking.